Hello everyone, Fall Papers here. So it's been about four months since I posted the Dusty Old Books presentation on mythology in My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, uh, and since then I've said on several occasions that I would eventually do a short follow-up video to respond to some of the questions and comments that people had. Uh, sadly, I can't reply to all of them in minute detail because we'd be here forever, and I don't think people have the patience for that. Uh, but there are a few points I definitely want to address, mainly things I didn't cover, either because I had to cut them for length, or more likely because I just plain missed them. Before I get started though, I do want to say a huge thank you to everyone who took the time to sit down and watch the presentation, uh, especially to those of you who left feedback, who left comments or tweeted or sent me an email. Uh, I honestly wasn't at all sure how the presentation was going to be received, so I was really pleased that the response was so positive on the whole. Um, I will say that alongside the praise, I also got some constructive criticism from a few people, uh, which I also do appreciate. Uh, it, it's helpful to me going forward with future projects and presentations, hint hint. So in all seriousness, thank you very much for that too. Let's get started with those damn columns. The ones I couldn't, or more accurately, wouldn't identify. Uh, Urk and Lulu writes their Ionic columns, by the way. I feel kind of lame for knowing that. Uh, similarly, Kuthan also writes, The columns of Cloudsdale are based on Ionian rhythm columns, the ones that you showed a Corinthian rhythm. Don't feel lame, Urk and Lulu. If anything, I should feel lame for not knowing in the first place. Uh, to both of you, though, I'm prepared to take your word for it. Although I did, against my better judgement, look to find out just how exactly one differentiates between column types. And let me tell you, it's, it's a really gripping reading. Uh, apparently Corinthian columns, like these, if I'm understanding Kuthan's comment correctly, are distinctively slender in terms of the ratio of their height to their thickness. Meanwhile, Ionic, or Ionian columns, like those of Cloudsdale, uh, have a, a characteristic scroll design at the top. Uh, which you can see in the background here, top right corner, uh, and which has been incorporated into the rest of the cloud architecture as a sort of visual motif. I think this is right. Uh, the keyword here is think. I may still be wrong, so please do correct me if necessary. Uh, but really, I'm, I'm quite happy to put the damn columns to rest and move on. Um, let's, let's talk about the labyrinth, because that's more fun. I mentioned that in the source myth, the unfortunate Athenians sent into the labyrinth as sacrifices were first stripped of their clothes and weapons and belongings, and that Theseus somehow, and we don't want to know how, managed to smuggle some items in anyway. What I didn't note, and what someone quite rightly pointed out to me, uh, was that indeed the very same thing happens with our heroes. Our pegasi have their wings taken away, and our unicorns lose their horns. That will teach me to pay attention. I really wish I could remember who pointed that out, but whoever you are, well spotted. You are absolutely correct. And it's the little details like these that I absolutely love, because they really do strengthen that connection to classical mythology, and in doing so, really enrich the way that myth is being repackaged and repurposed here. Uh, similarly, Blowed4 made a, a very astute comment, saying, I did not know about the story of Aphrodite having Minos fall in love with a bull. Tom would be proud. Now, I think you mean Minos' wife, uh, Pacifici, but your, your point is very well taken. It's a great observation. There is a really rich storytelling tradition going back forever uh, of gods, particularly of the trickster archetype, into which Discord fits quite nicely, although that's a topic for another presentation, hint, hint. There's this rich tradition of them interfering in the love lives of mortals, especially by making those mortals fall in love with the wrong partner. It's sort of how the gods get their kicks when they're not transforming into animals and having their wily ways with the mortals themselves. Uh, but it's this tradition that Shakespeare, for example, was using in A Midsummer Night's Dream, which is replete with classical nods and setting classical times with classical characters. Theseus, again, Duke of Athens. Anyway, we have Oberon having Puck enchant Titania to fall in love with Bottom, to ridiculous effect. Um, the connections there to our show are especially strong because Bottom ends up with the head of an ass, which everyone else can see as being rather silly, but of which Titania herself is utterly and blissfully unaware for most of the play, much like, as you point out, Rarity with Tom. So into that proud storytelling legacy, yes, we can now add a unicorn, fashion designer, and a big old hunk of rock. Eat your heart out, William Shakespeare. Another really nice observation was made by I Am Kilt, uh, saying, One of my 
personal favourite mythological illusions, whether intentional or not, was the Quarry Eels. As soon as I saw them, all I could think of was the legend of Scylla and Charybdis. Uh, talking there about the moment in May the Best Pet Win when Dash is leading her potential pets on a race through Ghastly Gorge, and this happens, the Quarry Eels. I really love that pun, it's just terrible and awesome. Um, for those of you who, who haven't read your Homer, first off, finger waggle, um, but Scylla and Charybdis were monsters who guarded the Strait of Messina, which is a very narrow waterway in the Mediterranean. Uh, the problem was that if you sailed to avoid one of them, invariably you got too close to the other. Uh, now, depending on who you ask, Charybdis is either a monster or, in some retellings, a, a whirlpool, but Scylla is definitely a monster, and really quite a nasty one, uh, variously described as having many sets of necks and heads and eyes and all sorts. And so the visual connection with the, the narrow pathway and this multi-headed beast coming at you unawares is absolutely spot on. But rather interestingly too, the, the notion of being caught between Scylla and Charybdis as a phrase uh, has become kind of analogous to being trapped between a rock and a hard place. Which in some sense is sort of where Rainbow Dash ends up when you think about it, so how about that? Poor Rainbow Dash, she looks so sad. I'm, I'm not going to dwell on that. Um, Spoilers, it, it's, she gets rescued, it's okay. Moving moving from Pegasi to Unicorns, uh, Nonsense 010688 brought up an interesting point. Uh, I said how scarce are, are references to unicorns in ancient material, given that they were generally understood to be uh, real rather than mythical creatures, but Nonsense points out that there is actually a reference in one of Caesar's commentaries from the Gallic War. Uh, and if you didn't know, Julius Caesar, uh, yes, that, Julius Caesar with et tu brute and all that, I did a fair amount of writing from the war front. How much of it is actually his is the subject of some debate, but regardless, nonsense is quite right. In Book 4 of the Commentarii de Bello Gallico, Caesar describes the Hessinian Forest, this stretch of woodland that runs from the Rhine across what's now southern Germany, and he describes one of the creatures that inhabits this forest saying, There is an ox of the shape of a stag, between whose ears a horn rises from the middle of the forehead, higher and straighter than those horns which are known to us. Now, if we're looking for a unicorn analogue, this does sound quite promising. Unfortunately, Caesar goes on to say, From the top of this, the horn, branches like palms stretch out a considerable distance. So by the sound of it, he's more accurately describing an elk, or a moose, or a reindeer, or what have you. That said, um, the forest did fascinate Caesar, or whoever inserted those parts into the commentary. He ascribed to it a kind of exotic, borderline mystical aura, so it's debatable whether or not we can count this as a unicorn reference. Uh, again, though, as with the rhino before, I really doubt that Rarity would much enjoy the comparison. I love using that image. Moving along to, to a rather uh, disturbing um, but well-observed point, uh, Anika Conservative writes, Just got to the part about man-eating horses, uh, talking about the mares of Diomedes, which were, yes, reputed to be man-eating. Didn't there used to be people in MLP? Now, I will confess I haven't seen earlier generations, and really I've no particular desire to do so, but, but having checked in with people who do know, um, yes, MLP did have humans at one point, um, Megan in Generation 1, apparently, and, and quite obviously, they're not around anymore. That's, that's really a thought that's going to fester, I think. Um, nasty implications, and I think the less said the better, because someone, I just know, is going to write a fanfic, if they haven't already. So, so moving right along, to Celestia and this slide. Uh, I was really glad that people got it. Um, R.M. Kenner or R.E.M.C. Kenner hit the nail on the head. Furthermore, I think Carthage must be destroyed. Cato the Elder ended his speeches with that quote. Yes, indeed. Uh, Cato the Elder was a Roman statesman, uh, this deeply principled, meaning stubborn, senator, uh, who reportedly did end all of his speeches in the Senate with those words or, or some variant. Ceterum conseo Carthaginum esse delendum. Uh, furthermore, I think Carthage must be destroyed. Now, Carthage was the long-time enemy of Rome, for reasons that get a bit complicated and dense. Uh, but it really didn't matter what Cato was talking about. He could have been talking about land reform, he could have been talking about the weather, but this was the axe he would continually grind. Uh, and eventually, Rome did destroy Carthage in 146 BC, 
Unfortunately, this came three years after Cato's death in 149, so it's a little bit sad he never got to see it, but probably a little bit sadder that they had to obliterate an entire city. Um, Adrian224 also got it, saying, I didn't know Celestia was such a conservative type, with a, a bit of a, a wink there. She certainly does look it there, doesn't she? Uh, I would like to imagine she's a little bit more gregarious and, and friendly than Cato. Um, I can't really see her wishing destruction on anyone in quite that fashion. Uh, but perhaps we'll leave it there. Back to back to more thematic questions and comments. 84 Tangelo asked, So was your mind blown with Cerberus and Tartarus? The mythological referencing became much easier to spot. Was my mind blown? D do you even really have to ask? I mean, I can, I can pretty much sum up my reaction in a single image. Enough said, I think. Well, all right, not enough said. In all seriousness, yes, I, I was very pleased to see more mythological allusions in Season 2, uh, especially Cerberus and Tartarus, which were far more direct than any of the references we'd really had up to that point. Uh, in terms of that specific instance, Twilight gives a pretty good description of Cerberus and Tartarus, although obviously made a bit more kid-friendly. Uh, Cerberus, the three-headed dog who guarded the gates of the underworld, we have to be careful not to conflate Tartarus with the entirety of the Underworld. The Underworld in Greek mythology is a pretty complex and, and multi-leveled realm of which Tartarus was, was one part, kind of the lowest. Now, it, it's the closest equivalent to a, a Judeo-Christian hell, but like all things mythological, it gets a bit more complicated than that. Um, in any case, when the gods, led by Zeus, overthrew their parents, the Titans, the Titans were cast down into Tartarus. It's a really nasty place. And it's actually really a very dark thing to include in My Little Pony, which means it's something that I'm going to examine in a lot more detail in another presentation, hint, hint. Uh, but more generally, yes, um, the fact that there has been more mythology this season really has made me quite happy. Um, when I made Dusty Old Books, I was, I was working under the assumption that the inclusion of these references was a deliberate act on the part of the creators, uh, just because the, the number and the type of references seemed a lot more substantial than what might otherwise creep in naturally in a show like this. It just seemed logical. Uh, and several people agreed with me. Um, one chap said, I think that someone or several someones on the staff of MLP, FIM, is quite knowledgeable about ancient myths and legends, and that their inclusion in the show is more than the result of casual familiarity. Now, I agreed with this point, but obviously I couldn't prove it at the time. Things have changed a bit in the last few months. Several more members of the cast and crew have joined Twitter, including a couple of the show's writers. I don't generally like to bug the talent, um, because they're busy people, uh, but I did feel like I had to ask the question, so I tweeted at Megan McCarthy and M.A. Larson just, just to ask what their experience was, if, if any, with mythology and classics. And Megan McCarthy responded, Thus, I, I took Latin in high school and studied Roman history and mythology in Italy for a summer in college. Does that count? Absolutely that counts. I mean, that's very cool. And th that didn't confirm my suspicions, but it, it certainly supported them. I asked more or less the same question of, of M.A. Larson a few days later. Uh, his response, uh, no, nothing formal, just some classes here and there on mythology and philosophy. Again, no direct confirmation, but definitely supported my suspicions. Um, not content with this, uh, I, I pressed my luck a little bit further, um, kind of forgetting that whole don't bug the talent thing, uh, but I replied to Mr. Larson, Righto, because I'm apparently English, um, I'm just curious because MLP seems to love making those references as much as I love seeing them. In fact, I am English. Uh, to which Mr. Larson responded, Lauren and Rob Renzetti, the show's story editor, told us writers that they wanted mythology infused into the show and encouraged us to look for ways and places to use it. I'll just let that sink in, because, again, my reaction. So it's official. Um, what had been suspected has, has been confirmed. The mythology is in there deliberately, and it's practically begging us to take a closer look. Uh, it's really worth noting as well that Larson, in particular, uh, very obviously took this instruction to heart, uh, since it was he who gave us Cerberus and Tartarus in It's About Time. Uh, he gave us that wonderful Icarus moment with Rarity in Sonic Rainboom. And for that matter, he gave us the Et Tu Gabby Gums moment in Ponyville Confidential, 
bringing it back to the death of Caesar and the last words attributed to him, made famous by Shakespeare in the play, Julius Caesar. And those are just a few of the, the, the plethora of references. So, so to M.A. Larson and, and Megan McCarthy and all the writers and Rob Renzetti and Lauren Faust, I want to say thank you. Thank you for giving this show actual depth and giving us as an audience the opportunity to have what what I and I think a lot of other people uh, feel is a great deal of fun exploring that depth. Um, and on, on the topic of continuing that, that exploration and discussion, and I'm going to put up this slide because I like it and you should have something cute to look at while I ramble. Um, if things work out as I'm intending for them to work out, I will be giving new presentations um, on the mythological and the, the classical topics. Uh, at both TrotCon and Everfree Northwest. So if you want more of this kind of ridiculous thing, that is where I will be. Please do come by. Uh, also, regarding Brony Scholars, as some of you will remember, that was meant to be a blog project. It never quite got off the ground, um, but it's taking a new form. It's rising again as a podcast, which will be coming soon, no doubt yet, but um, soon, to Everfree Radio, who are awesome, by the way. You should check them out. Uh, we're going to be looking at MLP from all kinds of pseudo-scholarly standpoints, all sorts of facets, and we're planning on bringing on some absolutely brilliant guests, so definitely stay tuned for news there. Uh, unsurprisingly, with me, the best way to keep up with all of this is through Twitter. Uh, you can follow at Brony Scholars to keep track of that show-related stuff uh, for updates on presentations, uh, whether I'm doing them at cons or just for the hair of it and for all the rest of my usual garbage. Um, you can follow my personal account at Foldpapers. You can also email me, foldpapers at gmail.com. And all those links are down there in the description. I know, shameless self-promotion. Really don't like it. Um, but what I do like is delving into this material. So if you like that too, take all of that for whatever it's worth to you. Um, that's it for now. A little quick video for you, but thanks for watching. Uh, and yes, Anico Conservative, to answer your other question, that was a Bill and Ted reference at the end of Dusty Old Books. It's my favourite line from the film. I throw it around quite a bit, and this video is no exception. So, once more, with feeling, be excellent to each other. Cheers. <laughs>